slate saying, look how great I am. And on the back, it's got some Egyptians with ropes around necks of two great sauropod looking, I mean, they look just like a children's book with a, a patasaurus on it or something, necks intertwined. And we have this motif repeated on two different, totally different places, separated by hundreds of years. Obviously, if there are engravings of sauropod dinosaurs which are hundreds of years old, uh, prior to any scientist reconstructions of fossils, the only way that we could say that they could have done it so uh, intelligently was if they had viewed the creatures for themselves, or at least had access to sketches or drawings or descriptions made by eyewitnesses of those creatures at around that time. As some people look at the fossil record, as some people look at evidence that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time, they see uh, pictures, they see drawings, they see carvings, they see uh, work in metal and weaving of uh, individuals that have actually reproduced dinosaurs. And the American Indian is uh, one of those uh, uh, groups that has done that, especially in uh, paintings and, um, and drawings. Adrian Mayer, first of all, if we talk about what she's done on this, I think we ought to give her credit for doing a tremendous amount of research. And when I say data, I mean legend after legend after legend after legend of descriptions of the same kinds of creatures that were giant, terrible lizards, um, there were thunderbirds, there were um, water monsters given the same description from tribe after tribe after tribe across North America, but even in South America and Central America, we've got this robust legendary lore, complete with descriptions of habitat, descriptions of habit, anatomical attributes. Where did all this come from? And some people say, well, we don't want to have the Indian living at the dinosaur, so the, uh, the uh, Indian went ahead and found bones, and then went ahead and assembled those bones into uh, the proper shape, and then put the musculature and the skin on the bones, and then based upon what they came up with, they then did a drawing showing what this dinosaur or uh, reptile would look like in life. Now, with all due respect, to the, the skills of the American Indian, and there are a great many of them, I honestly don't know if paleontology uh, hundreds of years ago was one of them. Well, the very fact that we have these artifacts begs the question, how did they know to draw these? In other words, if they're mythological, how, did, how is it that they all drew the same exact myth, <laughs> and yet they're separated through distant time as well as distant geography? And the question, it's a tough one to answer because it depends on your worldview. And if you back up and think, if I just go based on the data, then it seems to suggest on its surface that these people, real live people at some point, encountered creatures that looked like this. I've been informed that in a cave in France, there's a mammoth seemingly engaged with or in combat with a dinosaur. Now, if that's so, that's very significant because even though mammoths are extinct, everybody accepts that mammoths and humans live together because you sometimes find spear points of uh, uh, human spears in mammoth fossils or mammoth skeletal remains in caves um, and of course there are many drawings of mammoths by people and everybody agrees they're mammoths so um, if mammoths and humans are together and you see a picture of a mammoth and a dinosaur together then obviously dinosaurs and humans were together too which of course evolutionists say is impossible. American Indians had this legend they called this creature the grandfather of the buffalo and uh, you know that is that's an interesting description because you're like okay uh, what would a grandfather buffalo look like obviously it would have long hair it would look like a buffalo but they said it was much 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 bigger well there was a waterfall found in Minneapolis and um, underneath this waterfall was this uh, tusks of a mammoth and Indians actually pointed to that spot and said that's where the grandfather of the buffalo lived and what's fascinating is if they were able to understand the flesh they were understand the hairy characteristics of this mammoth, there is only one way they could have known that is if they would have actually seen the creature. And once again we see that the evolutionary time frame, that the layers in the rocks represent millions of years, comes to grief on things like this which 
uh, show that people, dinosaurs and mammoths and many creatures that we're familiar with today all lived at the same time. First of all, what we have to understand now was not until the year 1822 when Gideon Mantle and his wife found the Iguanodon tooth. And that was supposedly the absolute beginning of our understanding of uh, dinosaurs. And it be modern academia will tell you that is when we discovered them. Well, the problem with that is, is that we have all these images of ancient people groups that had intimate knowledge of dinosaurs. They drew them on vases, they were on pottery, and, um, if, and if it is true that they had no knowledge of dinosaurs, then where in the world did all those images come from? The people went to the police and demanded that something be done. The police gathered their weapons and their bravest officers and went off to see what they could find. Danny was terrified. He just wanted to find a friend. He was very old and had looked everywhere but couldn't find anyone else like him. It was like he was the last dragon on earth. You know, it's funny how historians treat ancient history. Because we've got a lot of ancient historians writing things that we take today as a matter of fact. Like, you know, this event happened, okay. But then when they start talking about some other things that they believed were true, historians will just discount it. Like, you know, Marco Polo's writing about dragons. Alexander the Great's talking about his giant lizard that frightened his army. Um, and there's all, all sorts of other accounts in history f as, as matter of fact accounts of great lizard-like beasts. And yet they're routinely discredited as not being true. You know, it is a misnomer that some of these dragon legends, or all the dragon legends, are just a product of opium-inspired pagan religions. I mean, that is not the case at all. What you have is you have actual historians. You have Herodotus. You have just, um, Flavius Josephus. You have Marco Polo that talk about dragons. Herodotus actually heard an account of flying reptiles, and he went and checked it out himself. And so, I mean, he showed the medal of a true historian. 400 years later or so, you have Flavius Josephus, a, an incredible Jewish historian, also talking about seemingly the same creature. You have this, this flying reptile. You have Marco Polo that, after his journey to China, uh, is describing a huge dragon. He calls it a dragon with this tail that is really dragging through the sand, leaving these marks. And um, we come to the point where we have to ask ourselves, are all these people just making this up? They are describing creatures that were not supposed to be alive then. According to evolutionary theory, that creatures like this were supposed to be separated by mankind for 65 to 70 million years. Yet, here we have respectable people writing in their history books, this is what I've seen, this is what I've witnessed. And they sound just like dinosaurs. Well, I think we should take the testimony of these very reliable historians. For the most part, I think that they were very candid in what they were writing about when it came to historical narrative. And if they were talking about these large, formidable creatures, I don't see why there's any reason to question that. If man and dinosaurs never lived together but were separated by millions of years, then we have to say all those ancients were mistaken. And I don't believe that we should accuse them of that because they were intelligent people like you and I. They built cities before the flood. We're told that they had musical instruments. They had tools of iron and brass. Now you think about that. Before the flood they had metal tools. That implies they had to find the metals, they had to mine them, and they had to smelt them exactly like we do today. So. Let us not dare accuse ancient people of being unintelligent and untechnological. The Bible does use the term dragons over and over again. It talks about ocean dragons, talks about flying dragons, talks about land dragons. And you know, that seems to fit with these great reptilian beasts that include the dinosaurs. It makes sense. If those things were so dominant on the planet before the flood and certainly right after the flood, they would have made it into the, 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 the history of the culture. In 1845, the, uh, a newspaper in um, the town of Geelong in Victoria published a sketch of a creature that the local Aboriginal people had described as a bunyip. Common Aboriginal term for monster, it's often thought of as mythical, but this Aboriginal had big deep claw marks across his chest and uh, the description he gave, presumably through an interpreter at the time, uh, was the basis of this sketch in the Geelong Advertiser and it looks very much like one of the, the duck-billed dinosaurs. In fact, some large bones were reported at that time that were fresh and were unlike 